Hello and welcome back to Tech Forge, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the boost clocks we achieved on our 2700X build, which was covered in the last two videos. If you haven't caught them, please do so, probably in the sidebar there somewhere, or by subscribing and checking out the channel. Damn loud cuss. So no, I'm super keen, I hope you're super keen. Let's get on in there and find out what's what. So just very quickly before we get started, I'd like to remind anyone who hasn't seen the previous two videos that we are in fact using the stock prism cooler that comes with the 2700X for these clocks. Now, from previous tests, from other YouTube videos and other articles around the interwebs, we've, we know that the prism cooler is capable of overclocking all core to around about 4 to 4.1 gigahertz before it starts to give up the ghost temp wise. For that reason, since that's already a known, I decided not to test an all-core since it would probably land somewhere in between stock and, and the boosted figures anyway in most of the games tested. Another deciding factor there was also my limited time with the machine. I did do the build for a friend and he was pretty keen to get back into it, I can't blame him. So I tried to get as much done as I could in a very small amount of time. So instead what we've done is we've decided to go with the stock clock. We've decided to utilize ASUS's level 2 overclocking profile, which is provided by ASUS in the BIOS. I'll show you where that is. And also, I had a look very late in the evening after I discovered it uh, at the Precision Boost override functions in the BIOS as well. So it seems to me that Precision Boost override is more intended for something with more exotic cooling, so high-end air cooling, or perhaps a water loop, custom water loop, AIO, something along those lines, to take advantage of those algorithms running a cooler CPU. So as it stands, we'll have the three. So as it stands, we'll have the three different modes that the the clocks were tested in. We were tested in synthetics to test the CPU, like Cinebench R15, also 3D Mark V Strike, Time Spy, also a couple of games, just to see if there's anything in it. To enable ASUS Level 2 Overclock, we go into the BIOS on the Crosshair 7 Hero in the Extreme Tweaker tab, and you can find an option called Performance Enhancer, which will get you four levels of overclock, with Level 3 and Level 4 requiring much heavier cooling than we have available, so Level 2 is chosen. While applying the Precision Boost Override function for my third run, I noticed a setting way down here in the Tweaker's Paradise tab called Sense MI SKU, which notes to enable to enhance Sense MI function for overclocking which I'm going to hazard a guess that could perhaps remove the AMD temp skew and allow Sense MI to turb up the cores faster as a result. I didn't get a chance to test this with enabled and disabled due to time constraints, but I'll investigate further if I get the chance. To access the Precision Boost override, enter the Advanced tab, AMD CBS, NBIO Common Options, Precision Boost override configuration, blah blah legal stuff, and herein lies the options to enable Precision Boost, change the scaling control to manual, and then choose which scaling option you would like. I found little to no difference between 8x and 10x, which could be down to the prism cooler being a limiting factor. All tests were run at the 8x scalar value. As for memory, stock and ASUS level 2 were run with 3200 C14 timings native to the kit, while the precision boost tests were run with 3400MHz 1.4 volt overclock with tighter sub timings as well which were achieved through using the stilt safe 3333 MHz timings, loosening out the RAS ACT from 30 to 32, and the TRC from 52 to 54, just to see if it could be run at 3400 MHz of these tighter timings. Subsequent testing showed that it indeed was stable. So onto the results, and starting with some Cinebench R15 scores and clocks, the stock run gave us a tidy multi-threaded score of 1818 and 179 on the single thread at a peak of 65 degrees Celsius and boost clocks across all cores around about the 3.9 gigahertz mark. With the level 2 overclock applied, the multi-threaded score increased to 1863 and 180 single core respectively at around the 4.1 gigahertz mark. However, temps jumped up to 74C and the volts were running up into the 1.5 volt range. Allowing PBO to run free, coupled with the bump in memory performance, this sees a peak of 1901 multi-thread in Cinebench, while single core remains at 180 points. Boosting initially to 4.2 GHz before settling into a roughly locked 4.15 GHz across all cores, the CPU peaked to only 72 degrees Celsius, which is a reduction despite the increased frequency. 
Observed voltages during the run showed the same 1.5 volts before starting the run. However, under load, the voltages actually dropped to 1.388 volts while remaining stable, which is much more reasonable. Starting the gaming benchmarks with 3D Mark Time Spy Physics, we saw stop clocks at 4 GHz and 71 degrees Celsius, level 2 clocks at 4.1 GHz and 81 degrees Celsius, and the PBO clocks at 4.175 GHz and 66 degrees Celsius. So running faster and reporting cooler, all the while scoring at least 500 points higher than the ASUS Level 2 overclock. We see much the same boost clocks of 4, 4.1 and 4.175 GHz respectively in Firestrike as we do in Time Spy, albeit at a much lower temperature. Stock hits a peak of 64 degrees Celsius, ASUS level 2 adds another 10 degrees to that for 74. However, overdrive comes in at less than stock at 63 degrees C, despite the almost 200 megahertz gain in clock speed. The net upside is the PB overclock is a full 1000 point increase over stock boost clocks, which is a fantastic result in any language. Moving on to in-game benchmarks now, we begin with Ashes of the Singularity. Probably the best title in the test setup we installed, Ashes really highlights how a modern game will utilise the cores of a processor like the 2700X. The 8-core 16-thread Ryzen 7 delivered boost clocks of about 4GHz, peaking at 65 degrees in stock trim, 4.1GHz at 73 degrees for ASUS Level 2, and 4.15 to 4.2GHz using the overdrive for an amazing 54 degrees Celsius reported. Furthermore, a major uptick in FPS was noted over the stock and Level 2 settings, Proving the boost clocks and memory performance increases can yield great results in thread-heavy workloads. Next up is the more lightly threaded Assetto Corsa in-game benchmarks, which shows a noticeable trend in boost frequencies between the three tested scenarios. 4.05 GHz at 51 Celsius for out-of-the-box results, 4.175 to 4.2 GHz at 61 degrees Celsius for ASUS Level 2, and 4.25 to 4.3 GHz at 46 degrees Celsius for overdrive indicate that with a more powerful GPU we may have seen better FPS spread between the overclocks. However, the 1050 Ti was not up to the task, giving us an FPS result that all fall within the margin of error with each other. Following Assetto is the benchmark staple Metro Last Light. The in-game benchmark seems to spread the load across multiple cores, but never really loads any of them up. Stock was able to hold around 4.05 GHz without any problem at 56 degrees Celsius. Asus Level 2 delivered around the 4.15 GHz mark at 64 degrees Celsius. And Overdrive saw a consistent 4.225 to 4.250 GHz boost state at only 49 degrees Celsius. The resulting FPS numbers were uninspiring though to say the least as it all came out pretty close to margin of error stuff yet again. Poor old 1050 Ti. Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor threw up an unexpected result. So far Overdrive has been significantly more impressive than Asus Level 2, but in Middle Earth the result was much closer. Hitting upwards of 4.2 GHz, Asus Level 2 was only a smidgen behind Overdrive at 4.25 GHz, although the former hit 54 degrees Celsius as compared to the latter's positively icy 39 degrees Celsius. The FPS result was just as close, with line ball separating the two, while stock settings came in quite a bit behind at around 4.05-ish GHz and 51 degrees Celsius. Lastly, but not lightly, Total War Warhammer brings us home, and I expected a good separation between the overclocks in what is known to be a heavy CPU title. But boy was I disappointed. The in-game benchmark only really pushed a couple of threads with any vigour, leaving the 1050 Ti as an extreme bottleneck despite the low in-game settings. Stock clocks again boosted to just over 4 GHz at 55 Celsius. Asus Level 2 hit up to 4.2 GHz for 54 degrees Celsius, and the FPS results are, of course not really relevant. And there we have it, the results of the 2700X on the Wraith Prism Cooler. By the look of these results, it's seeming that the 2700X responds best to gaming in the Precision Boost Overdrive mode. Also enabling the Sense MI could have really helped that there, if I'm correct, and that it does have something to do with the temperature reporting. 
can help the boost states so I would like to do some more testing if I get a chance on that just to see if it does in fact do what I think it does. The most impressive aspect was of course averaging around about 200 megahertz boost clock higher than stock settings on the exact same cooler, the exact same fan speed. Another option I wouldn't mind exploring would be to do some sort of manual vaulting as well as putting in a little bit of a base clock overclock on top just for those couple of extra gigahertz. Who knows, it could be, could be the difference there. It's perhaps unfortunate we didn't have a powerful enough GPU on hand to do some serious FPS testing and seeing if there really is an advantage to these higher boost clocks. But uh, you could probably infer that if you had something a lot more powerful like a 1080, 1080 Ti or a Vega 56 or 64 that you could probably see a fairly large discrepancy between these boost clocks, especially with the increased RAM speeds as well. That can really help with Ryzen as well, but between the RAM speeds and those boost clocks, I'm fairly certain you would see a decent uplifted performance. Overall, I'm quite impressed with what AMD have managed to achieve with their second generation Ryzen platform. We've got to keep in mind that the shrink, the no shrink, was actually from 14 nanometers to 12 nanometers. So two nanometers isn't a massive no shrink, so the performance gains of around about two to 300 megahertz over the generation before is actually quite impressive given that the gap between the nodes is really, really narrow. I think the 2700X offers quite a lot of flexibility in its performance. The boost in, in its single core speeds as well as the, uh, the memory latencies really translate into an improved gaming experience over the first generation Ryzen processors. And that carries over to productivity tasks as well. That 1901 Cinebench score on the Wraith Prism was, yeah, that blew my mind. I really wasn't expecting anything that high. So to see that result, I was quite stoked and very, very impressed overall with not only the 2700X, but also the Wraith Prism Cooler and what it can deliver. So what did you guys think of the Ryzen 2700X? Please don't hesitate to leave us a comment in the description below. I hope to bring more 2700X content in the future. With a bit of luck, I'll get some more access to it and I'll try out a few more things. We'll let you guys know how it goes. But for now, thank you for watching. Catch you in the next one.